Welcome to another moment in the Word. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Well, that is precisely the most important question, actually, you could ever ask. And I hope to be able to show you why it's the most important question. But it's the question our Lord himself asked. And he's asking Pharisees, Pharisees that have been asking him a question of what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus now is turning the table and he's asking them a question. Here's what we find. We're in Matthew chapter 22 and looking at verses 41 down to verse 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. And he said unto them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? No man was able to answer him a word. Neither dared he any man from that day forth to ask any more questions. This is a very important question. It gets to the very heart of, of our salvation, the very heart of Judaism, the very heart of what the gospel is about, the very heart of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, and the New Testament, the gospel. It, it, it comes down to the person of who Jesus is. But Jesus is now going to emphasize. He's gathering them together, and he asks them a question. He says, what do you think? The word for think is really critical because remember Jesus said you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And he changed the word from the Shema where it says all your might to all your mind. Because the mind is the gate that lets information in that eventually you're going to believe in your heart. And so it's the battle for the mind. And it's really important that you know, that you understand. Faith comes by hearing and hearing goes into the mind. It's so important. And so Jesus is saying, what do you think? The word for think there means that you are having a reasoned opinion. It's personal. And he's saying it to them. That's in the plural. He's saying it to all of them. He's saying it to you. It is so important that we not just read Scripture as if it's a history book and look and say, well, that's interesting, but that you understand that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's relevant. It's it's advantageous to you as the Spirit of God not only has led holy men to write it, but as he gives you then illumination to understand it, and that he gives you also the impetus to apply it and the grace to be able to obey it. So consequently, Jesus is asking, what do you think? What do you think of Christ? Notice he doesn't say of me. He's not talking just about himself. No, he's asking them, what do you think of? And the word Christ is Christos in the Greek. It is the word for anointed. It's the translation of the Hebrew word Meshich. And that is the word for anointed one. And anointed was that which was the prophet, the priest, and the king. And if a person was anointed, it was usually with oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It was for a purpose. They didn't just get an anointing to feel good. They were anointed for a purpose. And if you're anointed today by the Holy Spirit, it is not so you can brag about your power ability or that you would feel good. You have been anointed by the Spirit of God for the purpose to glorify God in whatever he has anointed you for. So this is the anointed one. This is a common expression. And so consequently, Jesus is saying, what do you think of the Christ. The word the, the definite article, is not found in most translations, but it is in the Greek because there is only one anointed one, one who is Messiah. And we find Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, whose son is he? 
And so he's now talking not about his work or his person, but he's talking about his genealogy. Whose son is he? Where did he come from? And that's so important, isn't it? This is the question we find repeated again and again in the New Testament. When Jesus calmed the storm on the lake, his disciples were amazed and they said, what manner of man is this that even the sea and the waves, they obey him? When John the Baptist sends his disciples back to Jesus with the question, who are you? Shall we look for another? Or when Jesus asked Peter at Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? And then more importantly, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers quest quite correctly and says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the anointed one and the Son of God. And then he goes on to say that Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood didn't reveal that, it was my Father in heaven. And if you know who Jesus is, you know who the Messiah is, you know who the Christ is, then you understand because God has revealed that to you. On Palm Sunday, as Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem, and it says the entire city was stirred, and they're asking, who is this? Well, that's a great question. Who is this? Who is this that a, that a third of the world today claim they worship him? Who is this? Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, he asked the question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you say, I am. Who are you? And in Luke's gospel, Simon the Pharisee, he asks, and in regards to Jesus, when he sees the, the way in which Jesus treats that sinful woman, woman caught in the act, he says, who is this that even forgives sins? Who is this? Or in John's gospel, when the Pharisees say, who are you? And Jesus says, I am the one that I have been declaring from the beginning. He has never changed in describing who he is, but it's important that you and I answer this question that Jesus is asking these Pharisees. It's important to understand the Pharisees. They believe in the word of God. They believe in a literal understanding and interpretation of the word of God. They believe in angels. They believe in the supernatural, and they believe in a personal Messiah. So consequently, Jesus is simply asking him, if you believe in Messiah, then who is he? And whose son is he? And so they respond. And they respond and they say to him, one word, David, David. That's right. However, you know, it's interesting on the day that in which Jesus enters into Jerusalem that we call Palm Sunday. That was when the crowds are crying out, Hosanna! That means save now, son of David. They are saying the same thing, but they go on to realize that the one who is the son of David is also their savior and the only one that can save now because that's what we find in Psalm 118, that very expression, save now. If Jesus is Messiah, then he is also our Savior. And then we find that Jesus said unto them, how is it that David in the Spirit, notice that phrase, in the Spirit? It, it, the translators did well by capitalizing Spirit. It's, it's not that they had some emotional, euphoric experience. No, it was in the Holy Spirit. You see, God in his spirit has led holy men of God to write, and it's his Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to understand. In fact, remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You have no understanding of what the kingdom is like unless you're born not of just flesh, but of the Spirit, you must be born again. And so it's David in the Spirit. David has now written 
what the Spirit of God has led, Jesus is making it very, very plain. This wasn't just simply David's opinion. This is David, as he is writing, led by the Holy Spirit, and it's a prophetic statement. In fact, this particular psalm that David is it now has written that Jesus is referring to is Psalm 110. It's quoted more than any other passage in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. It is a critical passage. It's quoted more than any other in the New Testament. And so consequently, he says, he calls him Lord, and if David calls him Lord, remember how who David is. David is a king. Now, David doesn't call anybody Lord. You can check it out in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. He doesn't call anybody Lord except God himself. So the question that Jesus is asking is, why does he call him Lord? Because if he calls him Adonai, if he calls him Lord, if he calls him Master, he's calling him something that is superior to David. You see, if you call Jesus Lord, you're acknowledging that he has sovereign right and control over you. That's why it's so important you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, because he is Lord, because he is God, and you're acknowledging his sovereign right over your life. And why does he then call him Lord? And then Jesus quotes this passage. And going to the passage is really important. You're looking now at Psalm 110, and I'm just looking at verse 1. The Lord, and you'll notice if you're looking at your text, more than likely, all of the letters are capitalized. That is because it's referring to the one who is commonly pronounced Yahweh. Some people pronounce it Jehovah. It is the yud Hey vav Hey. It is the name for the personal name for God. It is the covenant-making God. It is the one who is the eternal God. It is the name that is actually to be in Hebrew in the past and in the future. It is the one who is the forever God. So this one, who is the personal God, says unto my, David, my Lord. And But now the word is not the same. And even in your English text, you'll notice it's a capital L and then a lowercase O-R-D. And it's actually in the Hebrew, Adonai. Well, what is Adonai? Adonai is a one who is a ruler, one who is master, one who is king, one who is sovereign. So you now have the eternal God in his personal name speaking to David's Lord, his Adonai, the one David calls as his king, and he says, sit, sit. You're sitting because you're at rest. You see, he is sitting because it goes on to say, he is to sit at the right hand. That means that whoever this one is, he is co-regent. He is co-ruler with God himself. And then he is to sit until he makes his enemies his footstool. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that the last enemy is death. You see, death died when Jesus rose and that he is now the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. My dear one, what a great blessing this is. You will find in the rest of the psalm, it's only seven verses long, and it talks about the one who is the king and priest over. And because as a priest, you see, he had to offer a sacrifice. And what has to happen is that we see who Jesus is by the death of, of his body on the cross so that you might see his glory in the resurrection. And the same thing happens in you, my dear one. We must suborn our flesh so that the Spirit of God might have control and reign in us. Oh, it is such a blessing. So David quotes that, and our, our Lord quotes David, and then says, if David called him Lord, how is he his son? Well, now you see what's really going on. He was the son of David because, and that's what Matthew says in verse 1, chapter 1, that he is human. But where the Pharisees go wrong is they see him only as human. 
They don't see him as the son of God. So when Jesus asked the question, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? Well, they were right. He's the son of David. But they were not completely right because he's the son of God. And that's what you and I have to understand. And if you do understand it, then you know that your salvation is really quite incredible. Jesus is asking this question not to humiliate these people. Remember that there was one of these Pharisees that was very close to the kingdom of God, we find in Mark. And there is Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus is among the Pharisees that are there. Jesus is giving them an invitation, an opportunity once again to receive him, to acknowledge him as their Messiah, their Savior, their Lord, their God. But we do not know who he is unless we see him on the cross, for there is God's love made manifest to us. And we see his resurrection then in his being the power of overcoming. And so we see here that after this, no man asked him any more questions. Why not? Well, because they had just been checkmated. They had just now been realized as they thought it through. They have no answers. And the only reason now that they don't accept him is because of their own stubbornness, their own heart, their willfulness in rejecting him. But they need to admit who they're crucifying is God himself. They need to admit that. And you need to acknowledge if you're rejecting Jesus, you're rejecting your only hope. You're rejecting God. I pray, my dear one, you know Jesus. You know him as your Savior. You know him as your Lord. And when he died on the cross, his body, identifying with you, paid your penalty. And his blood is Emmanuel's blood that gives you eternal life. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how you changed us. Thank you for the, fat, the power of the gospel that brings life, eternal life, to each of us. In Jesus' holy name we pray.